morning and welcome. This is the inaugural webinar of the series on the value of applying analytics to real world problems. These webinars are an initiative of the informed practice section. My name is Patricia Neri. Dr. Carrie Beam and I are the organizers of this webinar series. Professor Anna Nagurni is the John F. Smith Memorial Professor of Operations Management at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the Director of Virtual Center for Super Networks. She conducts research on various network systems, including perishable product supply chains. Anna is an informed fellow and a Worms Award recipient. Her articles and books have been cited more than 17,000 times, according to Google Scholar. She is one of 44 women in STEM, featured in the STEM GEM book on inspiring role models by Stephanie Esty. In this webinar, Dr. Nagurni will talk about how this COVID-19 pandemic is affecting perishable product supply chains, including a variety of food ones, PPEs, which are time sensitive, as well as blood supply chains, and how analytics can be used to determine the steps for recovery. At the end of this presentation, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. Anna, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with the inaugural webinar for the INFORM's practice session series. I will be speaking to you about some research that we have been doing over many years and also more recently as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all dealing with. Specifically, the title of my presentation is Blood, Sweat, and PPEs, Rescuing Perishable Product Supply Chains and Impacting Policy Through Analytics. I truly believe that our great field of operations research and analytics has never been more valuable. Uh, we are sought after in terms of our expertise, and we're adding a great deal to discussions and to helping our society in this very, very difficult time. So now I would also like to thank the Informs Practice Section Board and Dr. Patricia Neri and also Dr. Carrie Beam and the Informs Board because we had a great brainstorming session in terms of logistics and also publicity for this event. And I thought it's very appropriate to be dedicating this webinar to all the essential workers from the high tech workers, the healthcare workers, freight service providers, grocery store workers, the farmers and the food processors. They have truly helped to sustain us during this very difficult time and they have made great sacrifices. So thank you so very, very much. The presentation today will be quite a panoramic one. I hope to engage you and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A with you. I'll begin with some background and motivation because I think it's important to set the uh, kind of stage for this talk. And then I'll be talking about one of the supply chains that has suffered probably uh, some of the biggest disruptions and that's food supply chains. I'll then transition to some healthcare applications and specifically be discussing where are the personal protective equipment? Where are the PPEs? I will then discuss blood supply chains. This is research that we've been doing for close to a decade and uh, the specific challenges in this pandemic and also some fantastic opportunities in terms of convalescent plasma. I think that our field is extremely energized right now, and not only in terms of research, but in terms of public speaking engagements, 
in addition in trying to impact policy through analytics. So I will also be discussing some recent headway that we have had in that area that I think is really, really important. So some background and motivation. I work on the modeling of network systems. Networks are pervasive. It's something that fascinates me from the very, very beginning. I began uh, doing a lot of research in transportation and logistics. I uh, transitioned to supply chains, but have also, as the director of the Virtual Center for Super Networks, did a lot of work on social networks integrated with supply chains and integrated with financial networks, uh, all sorts of energy networks, and uh, so on. So, and the internet, even. We've had a big, uh, a series of NSF grants to re envision the internet. So, but most of my recent research has been focusing on supply chains and different types of supply chains, but the majority of them I would classify as being uh, under the heading of perishable product supply chains. So I like I'll be talking about you know how we even define perishable product supply chains. Now these are some of my books. I enjoy uh, writing networks, and most of my books do have network themes. However, I've also had the pleasure of organizing several Dynamics of Disasters conferences in Greece with collaborators from Spardalos and Elias Kotsirias. And we have uh, two edited volumes on that topic, which is also very, very relevant now because we're dealing with a major global healthcare disaster, okay, which is unique over time and space. So in our research on perishable and time sensitive uh, product supply chains, uh, we have a very multidisciplinary approach. And this is something I emphasize to students. You never know which subjects that you've taken in college may be very, very useful for your research or you know, your work as a practitioner. So we utilize results from physics, chemistry, biology, and medicine to capture the perishability of various products over time from healthcare products such as blood, medical nucleotides, pharmaceuticals, as well as food. So what about food supply chains and disruptions? Okay. We know that food is essential to our health and well-being, okay? It's essential to fortify our immune systems, especially now when we're dealing with the coronavirus. During the COVID-19 pandemic, declared on March 11, 2020 by the World Health Organization, the associated supply chains have suffered major disruptions. And that's happening in different kinds of food supply chains is happening in terms of fresh produce, it's happening in terms of meat, it's happening in terms of dairy, as well as in uh, seafood supply chains. So our first work uh, on fresh produce food supply chains was actually published in the European Journal of Operational Research in 2013. It's a highly cited paper. And that was a paper where we actually had a game theory perspective because many of the you know, fresh produce uh, producers, actually they might be differentiated by brand in terms of quality and so forth, but they're competing with others. And in this model, we actually capture the deterioration of fresh food along the entire supply chain from a network perspective. And the way we handle perishability is through the use of generalized networks. Each of the links will have an associated multiplier, which will capture certain features of the link, for example, like time and so on. Uh, here, we are also, we care about sustainability, okay, because we want to minimize waste. And uh, so we handle disposal of spoiled food products as the fresh produce moves down the supply chain network. And we allow for different kinds of technology in terms of storage, for example, and also freight transport. So here, since I work on networks, I think uh, we can gain a lot of insights through different network topologies. And then you can see, for example, this is a more complex food supply chain as opposed to a farmer's market supply chain, which I'm going to be showing you shortly. And there will be, for example, you know, different kinds of supply chain network activities. We'll have production, shipment, processing, and in some of the fresh produce, the processing might be fairly simple. 
Okay, we'll have shipment, storage, and distribution to points of demand. And each of these firms is interested in maximizing its profits, uh, subject to cumbering different kinds of costs. So we see, you know, how much of the produce actually arrives at the destination, given that you might have perishability in transit where it's uh, on various pathways. So it has a lot of interesting features. Now, Another kind of supply chain which has analogies and also very, very relevant uh, to COVID right now is, you know, the pharmaceutical supply chains. There you also typically have a couple of firms competing with one another, seeking to maximize profits. Uh, a lot of the pharmaceutical products are actually, you know, part of a cold chain. So you'd have, for example, perishability. And here we also use a generalized network kind of oligopoly model uh, to model the competition. And that was work done uh, with former doctoral students of mine who are now professors. And interesting here in this kind of application, uh, we even introduced generic competition. And I think as we work on, you know, the world works on vaccines and medicines to combat the coronavirus, uh, this kind of research will be extremely relevant. I know our community is very, very engaged in pharmaceutical supply chains. So here you have kind of the network topology associated with the different pharmaceutical firms. And we also allow for essentially direct links from manufacturing uh, options and manufacturing plans to points of demand. Because as you're seeing now, e-commerce is playing a huge role, okay, actually saving many of us and so on, okay, in terms of uh, getting your medicines, getting your supplies, so we have more direct links from the plants to the points of demand. Okay, something else which we've been very, very interested in, and it's with a recent PhD student of mine who just received her PhD, Dr. Dani Spasic, is that of farmers markets. Uh, when you have farmers markets, you can immediately see from the network topology that these supply chains are much shorter. So there's a chance of less risk as you propagate along the paths. There's, you know, a chance that uh, you won't have as much damage, you won't have as much perishability, you won't have maybe a broken chain and so on. And now as the U.S. embarks on, you know, the beautiful season of spring, we're seeing farmers markets open up around the country, even Ours in the town of Amherst has opened up today and neighboring Northampton, obviously the social distancing and so on. And here uh, you have also, you know, the time issue is compressed. Uh, you're helping local farmers and uh, there's a lot, a lot of opportunity here. And in this research, we do something quite unique associated with each link will be certain parameters uh, in terms of humidity, in terms of time, in terms of temperature. So you can actually determine the quality of the product, okay, as it goes down a pathway and to the consumers at the demand points. And you can get the data. We work uh, with food science data, which is really, really exciting, I find. Uh, to find uh, these different kinds of parameters and decay in terms of food quality for, you know, a lot of your favorite fruits, you know, strawberries, you know, apples and peaches, as well as vegetables. So uh, this is work that we've also generalized uh, to more complex supply chain networks and even to oligopolies. Now, what about the disruptions that we're seeing with COVID-19? Okay, they are many. In the United States, uh, many of the meat processors are parts of major agribusinesses. There are only a few of these major oligopolistic, actually, firms that are competing. And uh, in addition to nursing homes, meat processing plants have been some of the major incubators, actually, of COVID-19. And this is something that has disrupted our meat supply chains, especially beef and pork. Uh, you're seeing probably in the grocery stores uh, uh, shortages, actually major shortages, or and or that uh, the food is actually being rationed meat. You can only purchase one or two items of a particular meat. 
Okay, so in March, there was still a lot of uh, meat in storage in terms of, you know, frozen meats and so forth. And now how have the companies responded? Well, they've closed many of these big meat processing plants. Some of them are in the Midwest. There's even one in Pennsylvania, on the East Coast and so forth, uh, because you know people were getting very, very ill. Okay, they've had to redesign some of these uh, meat processing plants. Uh, they, it needs time to redesign them. They need to get the protective equipment. And also many of other employees who tend to be not paid so well, they're falling ill. Okay, so this is something very, very, very troubling. Okay, but it's essential to take care of the employee's health and very, very challenging. It's happening though, not only in, you know, inorganic meats, but also in terms of organic chicken. And coupled with that, we're seeing major price increases is being projected that meat supplies and grocery stores could shrink as much as 35% and prices could rise 20%. When it comes to fresh produce, okay, originally uh, folks were hoarding not only, you know, a lot of paper products, toilet paper, right, and uh, cleaning supplies, but also orange juice, okay, which is really, really interesting. And now, Farmers, for example, and this is extremely painful, have had to discard their produce that they've worked so hard to grow. The oranges, potatoes in the Midwest, strawberries even in California, because there's a lack of timely processing capabilities at these kinds of food processing plants. So you envision, you know, the big, comp more complex supply chain network. If you have the links broken in between, you know, there's no connectivity. Okay, which is, you know, terrible. Okay, in addition, uh, we're seeing that animals are even being culled. That's happening in terms of hogs, for example, with millions of hogs needing to be euthanized. Okay, coupled with this, and this is something I'm going to be uh, discussing a little bit more, is the issue of labor. When we've been uh, working a lot on supply chain networks in our community, uh, I don't think we've emphasized labor enough. And now we're seeing precisely in the COVID-19 pandemic, shortages of labor due to illnesses, okay, due to fear of going to work. Uh, and also when it comes to uh, picking fresh produce, much of the labor is migrant labor, okay? And there are all sorts of restrictions being put on migrant labor now which is resulting in big shortfalls for labor in uh, this particular sector. Okay, another issue that has affected food supply chains is when the pandemic hit, schools got closed, restaurants got closed, many businesses. Those were outlets for many of these uh, food products. So the distribution channels changed and also the types of food typically that one would distribute to schools and restaurants are quite different than for consumers. So that was another issue. So now we're seeing that in terms of our area, we really need to re-envision distribution channels in terms of you know, redesign and so forth, and also in terms of packaging. Now on the demand side as well, you know, many of the children are not being fed properly. They're not getting, some are actually in some communities, school buses are driving around to feed the children and providing them with lunches and so forth, but not everywhere. And food insecurity is rising nationally. Uh, Massachusetts very, very recently committed, committed actually $56 million to fighting food insecurity because local pantries are struggling to keep up with the demands. So here, you'll see that many of the uh, topics that I've highlighted and the challenges have also been the subject of coverage in the media, okay, in terms of guest worker shortages, uh, in terms of, you know, um, the fresh produce and the meats of being uh, discarded, not processed correctly, and so on. And another thing I'd like to also emphasize, this is not only a national phenomenon, we're going through a pandemic that's affecting the whole world. You've seen it also in Italy and even Germany, okay? In Germany, they're actually flying some of the mar migrant workers from Eastern Europe to be able to pick their produce, including their very favored white asparagus. 
So during these challenging times, I think our community has been quite active. I think many of us are, you know, fueled by adrenaline uh, to try and contribute. Okay, so uh, we, I wrote a, a new paper on perishable food supply chain networks in the COVID pandemic which actually incorporates labor specifically along the supply chain network links. I think that was something that economists were emphasizing, but we weren't emphasizing enough. And it was imperative to try and figure out the impacts of shortfalls. What happens, for example, if freight service provision is not available? What, uh, what if the capacity is much lower in a meat processing plant and so on? You know, what could a firm do? Could it maybe market? Maybe so consumers will be willing to pay higher prices and so on. So here in this work, this is essentially, this is no longer a game theory model because we really wanted to deep dive into a single food firm. And also, you can see this is almost like a synthesis of work in terms of our uh, farmer's market food supply chains and our oligopoly work, because we're also seeing that uh, some food firms are actually trying to market more closely. Okay, for example, some students are even picking potatoes in the Midwest. Uh, the, they're helping out to be able to sell to the local communities and even to transport. So you see that you can have like shorter uh, paths, for example, and that'll help, for example, because uh, you can let duplicate pathways and so on. So now in this model, what we have done is we have labor capacities on each of the links in the supply chain network. And we have essentially what the economists would call a linear production function. So depending upon how much labor you have, you have a certain amount that you can process in terms of product flow on the particular link. So here uh, we have factors of production. Uh, you can see also not only what happens if the capacity gets tightened on a particular link in terms of labor, in terms of the prices and the flows and so on. But also you think of many of these employees, food processors, they're getting ill. They may be, you know, free of the, uh, be testing negative, but still when they come back to work, they not, might not be able to be their fully productive selves. Okay, so we have factors of production uh, that will show how much they can process and so on. Also, uh, our work shows that lack of labor on a single link can have dramatic effect. Okay, so you can kind of identify which are the most important links. Okay, and you should really work on preserving and investing in those uh, to the greatest degree. Uh, clearly preserving productivity and all utilized supply chain network economic activities is critical. We also truly believe that adding more direct sales, whether farmers markets, and we can, you know, we do this quantitatively. We do the modeling, we do the algorithm development, the computational work, getting the data and so forth, uh, that more direct sales may really help a food firm in a pandemic. And our work is showing that. And I think that's really important. So we're envisioning, you know, almost like new kinds of food supply chains in the US and actually around the world. Okay, also for all the marketing types out there, if a firm enhances its marketing, okay, so the consumers are willing to pay a higher price. And I think that many consumers, okay, we have, you know, budget constraints and so forth, but we care about feeding our families well and so on. So uh, to pay for, you know, high quality food, okay, is worthwhile. And uh, actually food firms can increase profits in this way too. So now I think, you know, we've been, what happened in 2008, 2009, we had another major, you know, economic collapse, but it was a financial one. And there with a former student of mine, now a professor at Penn State, Dr. Uh, Patrick Chung, we wrote our Fragile Networks book, where we have applications to supply chains, financial networks, social networks, uh, also to the internet, a certain performance measure that we constructed 
which allows you to determine and rank which are the most important nodes and links. So this can be used in also food supply chains, even under uh, perishability and so on. I think it's extremely uh, relevant now and we need to preserve those critical uh, supply chain links and nodes uh, as much as possible. And this gives you a quantitative perspective. So now let me move to uh, another application which we've been working on. And this is something that historically we've been very interested in. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the journey. Where are the PPEs? Okay, so if you look at, you know, classical examples of perishable foods, you know, in goods, we think about fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, meat and dairy products, right, medicines and vaccines, radioisotopes, cut flowers, and even human blood. But here we really can take the broader perspective of products being perishable in terms of, you know, supply, Okay, and also demand, okay? And if you look at PPEs, for example, masks, they're supposed to be discarded for the most part after one use. So it's clearly a perishable good. And also what we've seen, uh, sadly, in our national stockpile for such PPEs, that many of the uh, masks, for example, had deteriorated they were past the expiration date, okay, and should not be used. So that also helped uh, uh, actually to create the shortfall and the shortages. So I first became interested in PPEs a few years ago. I teach a class at the Eisenberg School of Management, which is very uh, interdisciplinary, on humanitarian logistics and healthcare. And a very important aspect of the class is guest lectures by practitioners. And a few years ago, I saw a letter to the editor in the New York Times by Miss Debbie Wilson, who propitiously and coincidentally also was studying uh, nursing at UMass Amherst. Uh, she had worked with Doctors Without Borders battling Ebola, one of the most brave people I have ever met, okay? So she came to speak to my class on two different occasions. In fact, she was instrumental in starting an Ebola treatment unit, unit ETU, at the height of the Ebola epidemic. She had to uh, bring supplies in via boat. It was an uh, incredible, incredible experience. And this is actually, when you think about the PPEs that were needed then, you know, essentially, uh, the nurses and so forth, they endured very dire conditions in 100 degree temperatures, but they also saved many, many, many lives. So Debbie Wilson has a chapter in her book, Ode to the Humanitarian Logistician, Humanistic Logistics Through a Nurse's Eye, which if possible, I urge you to read it because I think as you know, operations researchers, you'll really appreciate uh, the importance of logistics in this dimension and also the importance of PPEs. So we wrote a paper actually on freight service provision because that was one of the issues actually associated with battling Ebola. Uh, the supplies to protect the medical staff were just not getting in there and that was essential. Okay. So we looked on the competition and also uh, the prices and so forth and the flows. And that was published in one of our Dynamics of Disasters volumes. And there also we introduced a price of anarchy associated with this uh, disaster relief uh, kind of application where uh, the price of anarchy is the ratio of the total cost of the equilibrium solution over the system optimized solution. For example, what if the freight service providers will work with a humanitarian organization to minimize the total cost and you can handle the generalized cost. Okay, so where are the PPEs? Uh, this is something that we've been dealing with and the issue continues still you know, into June. In early March, the Department of Health and Human Services reported, you know, the national stockpile had 12 million N95 respirators and 30 million surgical masks. This was only 1% of the estimated number of masks that the nation would need in a severe pandemic. 
Okay, what about the supply chain for PPEs? Okay, paper products, toilet paper, we can manufacture in the US. That's easy, not complex. But uh, PPEs, especially N95 respirators, they're much more complex. Okay, you need much more quality control, testing, and so forth. Uh, prior to the coronavirus outbreak, China made half of the world's face masks. Where did the COVID-19 pandemic originate? In China. So when the outbreak took off there, China started to use its supply and hoard what remained. Okay, this problem has only spread. Uh, more countries make sense for their own citizens. They hoarded the medical supplies, with some even banning PPE exports. So as the demand increased due to COVID-19, there was less supply to go around. Okay, and look at this in mid-April from Tennessee. We are out of everything, wrote a staffer at a large hospital. Okay, providers using one mask for three plus weeks. Many COVID patients zero counts. Okay, this is horrific. And also here you have game theory entering in. You had individual state governments, okay, and healthcare systems competing for resources, especially PPEs and ventilators. So New York State would be competing with Tennessee, with Virginia, and also hospitals competing with each other because there wasn't any kind of centralized kind of, you know, perspective control for sharing, okay. Uh, and what happened in eight, end of April, okay, Honeywell and a unit of Owen and Miner Inc. received Pentagon contracts to make 39 million uh, N95 face masks for medical workers under the Defense Production Act. And this was interesting because it was the military's first use of the Defense Production Act in the coronavirus crisis. And uh, millions were awarded, but still they're insufficient amounts. Very recently, I found out that there's another possibility of a use of a different kind of mask, which is known as an elastomeric. It costs only about 30 to 40 dollars, and it can be cleaned, used over and over again, okay, which is really, really interesting. So you see some of the issues, and also there were, uh, there were quality issues too. Uh, some of the masks that were manufactured in certain parts of the world that were shipped to the U.S. did not have the right kinds of standards, so that caused delays, you know, that affected illnesses, the well-being of our healthcare workers, and so on. Okay, so here, this is May 20, 2020, a survey of healthcare workers in the Washington Post and look at this, 66% are saying one of the biggest issues is that we still do not have respirator masks. And that's terrible, absolutely terrible. So here what we did is uh, in a new paper, we decided let's focus not on perishability per se using a generalized network approach, but let's look at you know, maybe reallocating labor so not just having maybe capacities of labor on different supply chain links, but maybe having a single capacity associated with a tier in terms of production. Maybe you can move some of the workers from facility to facility, or you can move, say, the freight service providers and assign them to different routes and so on. And then also, perhaps you have a single capacity okay, of labor over the whole supply chain network and you may be able to retrain people, okay, and reallocate your scarce labor resources. And then I find really, really interesting because, for example, in uh, parts of Europe, some of the airlines, okay, have laid off the personnel, it makes sense, you know, major economic impacts, but they are being retrained to be healthcare workers to assist in the battle uh, against COVID-19, okay? So here we had, this was also an optimization model, not a game theory model. And you see the kind of supply chain topology we have manufacturing and transportation, distribution center storage, and also final distribution to points of demand. So when we're dealing with PPEs and ventilators, the points of demand can be hospitals, healthcare facilities, nursing homes, which have suffered you know, egregiously in this pandemic in terms of loss of life and illnesses and so on. Okay, so 
we really like the idea of you know the three sets of labor constraints and then computationally we've investigated all sorts of dis uh, distinct scenarios different types of disruptions uh, also the possibility what if you can add another freight service provider uh, what if you can add another production site okay uh, what happens also to gains in productivity loss in productivity and I think in terms of, you know, reallocating labor to different kinds of supply chain network act activities, there's a lot of opportunity there. And in fact, um, you see in the third bullet here, McKinsey and com a company noted, this is a means towards resilience and returning the supply chain to effectiveness while re-envisioning and reforming. And also might help, you know, with unemployed folks and so on. Okay, so here, Excuse me. When we come to uh, producing ventilators, which are very complex, and also even respirators, it's not going to be like simple food and fresh produce, for example, moving down the supply chain network. You're going to need different components. Okay, so uh, we a few years ago, and we even have a book competing on supply chain quality with Dr. Dong Lee, who's now at Babson, is a professor, in which we uh, do a very general model, okay? And associated with the model, we also have supply chain network performance measures to identify which is the most important component, for example. So, you know, you wouldn't want to uh, work with just a single supplier, because in case something goes wrong, as we're seeing, if you can't get you know, components from China or other parts because you've outsourced so much, okay, you won't be able to produce these essential, you know, uh, PPEs and ventilators. So here we have the supply chain network topology and we allow for in-house manufacturing based on capacity or also outsourcing. And uh, one can then identify, you know, if you have the whole supply chain, and this is a game theory model, which are the most important suppliers, which are the most important firms, so if something goes wrong, uh, you also have quality impacts, for example, uh, what happens to the profits, the flows, and so on, and shortages. Okay, so here I'm now transitioning uh, to a topic which has fascinated uh, actually my doctoral students and collaborators for about a decade. I'll be talking to you, because I'm talking about blood, sweat, and PPEs, about blood supply chains. Blood is a most unique product. It cannot be manufactured. It cannot be produced. It has to be donated by you and me. Okay, so I'll be talking about that and also the opportunities in terms of convalescent plasma. So blood is a perishable product, okay? In terms of red blood cells, usually it's 42 days. Okay. And in terms of uh, platelets, it's five days. In terms of plasma, you can freeze it for a year, but then once it's thawed, it's only five days. And when it comes to blood supply chains, you know, blood transfusions are essential to major surgeries. Blood is used in the treatment of many diseases, sickle cell anemia, and some cancers. And also blood is used for victims of trauma, accidents, or natural disasters. In the pandemic, there are parts of the US, for example, in Philadelphia, where blood has been rationed because there weren't enough supplies and people were able to get the cancer treatments to start. The same thing with sickle cell anemia, and that is just horrible. So before the pandemic, okay, US needed quite a lot of uh, units of red blood cells, platelets, and plasma on a daily basis. Now, when you think about the supply, about 38% of the U.S. population is eligible to donate. However, less than 10% of the eligible population actually donates in a given year. And now you have many getting sick. When you have the flu, when you have the cold, when you're sick with COVID, you're not supposed to donate. Okay. Also, you have issues of seasonality. So these are all important points. On top of that, the blood services industry has undergone a major kind of transformation over the last five years or so, and a lot of economic upheaval. upheaval. Okay, not only have uh, blood service organizations have to, had to engage in new kinds of testing, which they don't get compensated for by the government. You know, we've had Zika fairly recently, 
Uh, at the same time, you know, there are changes in medical procedures, which is kind of good in a way, but that provides economic pressures because uh, they're not getting compensated as much for their testing, their processing, and so forth. And as a result, uh, this industry has been the subject of mergers and acquisitions. And for the most part, this is nonprofit, so it's really interesting. So the American Red Cross uh, is responsible for about 40% of the demand satisfaction of blood components nationally. So what happened uh, when the pandemic struck? Okay, it was March 11th. And because schools were closed, businesses were closed and so forth, many of the mobile units, which serve as major collection uh, units for American Red Cross and other blood service organizations, they had to be canceled. So this was very, very frightening. And you can see many of the headlines, Washington Post, New York Times, and so on. And uh, some of the shortages still continue. Blood donations are needed. Obviously, the elective surgeries have been canceled, but now they're starting to open up. So blood banks are calling for urgent donations due to COVID-19. Now, in terms of this, you had, in mid-March alone, the Red Cross had to cancel almost 3,000 blood drives, which was huge, okay? Uh, at the same time, and I know this from personal experience, some donors were concerned about risk of contracting COVID-19. Although blood service organizations now, they stepped up with greater attention to sanitation. Uh, they're essentially collecting only through appointments. Uh, they're spacing out you know, uh, the beds for collection. They're uh, taking more time to sanitize. Uh, the staff is wearing masks and so on, but still you have disruption to labor and so on. But it's very, very important to donate blood. So our first paper on blood supply chains was written uh, actually eight years ago. And you can see the topology here, okay? There's testing that's involved and the American Red Cross actually uh, shut down some of its testing facilities, even in our area of Western Massachusetts, Central Massachusetts. Uh, they actually uh, stopped a lot of the mobile drives even before the pandemic hit. So you see there are many, many challenges. And you have the storage, the shipment uh, to distribution points. Okay, so the blood supply chain network model, it is a generalized network. We have discarding costs. We still, we have uncertainty associated demand points and also costs associated with shortages and surpluses and supply side risk. So more recently, because of what was happening in terms of the economics, uh, we did a model on mergers and acquisitions in the blood banking industry, and we found something very relevant to what's happening with COVID-19. It's essential to be doing teaming even across you know, major geographic areas with the demand. Okay, Under the status quo, you might not get enhanced synergies, uh, but now, Okay, if you get, you know, great demand in certain parts of the country, you should be teaming. And interesting enough, there's a lot of uh, competition. American Red Cross, you know, originally was competing with other blood service organizations. And there's even competition with some for-profit uh, blood service organizations moving in. So we would do the modeling before the merger and then the modeling after the merger was associated costs and have uh, different kinds of metrics. So in terms of the rise of competition of the blood service organizations, think about this. There's a limited pool of donors. Uh, now the pool is even uh, more drastically reduced because of COVID-19. And also hospitals are competing for the blood. Okay, so you know you have competition on uh, the procurement side, you have competition on the demand side, and so on. So we wrote a paper. So this is one of my former students, is a professor at Pace University now that was published in the Annals of Operations Research, also one in Omega, where you actually model the competition for donors. And also we do a lot of work in terms of the pricing. So the organizations can recover the costs, uh, what will be the prices the hospital is charging and so forth. Remember, blood donors do not get paid. Okay, so this is the topology. Okay, so what about hope? Convalis and plasma and hope. I, I'm sure that you've been reading in the newspapers, seeing on the news and so forth that 
Uh, there's been a clamoring for convalescent pl convalescent plasma. This is plasma of COVID-19 survivors uh, who have tested positive for antibodies. Um, Johns Hopkins University has a wonderful website that tracks all the cases of COVID-19. And as of May 1st, about 154,000 people in the US have recovered from the virus. There have been uh, studies actually recently published in the world in uh, Wall Street Journal of sick patients who got plasma transfusions from those who had recovered, had better survival rates compared with control groups. And now there are additional rigorous studies happening, uh, not only in New York and different parts of uh, the US, but also in Europe and in India. And many of the survivors, they really want to donate, okay? Now, this is a heroic effort to save the lives of people, okay? Also, um, Mayo Clinic in Rochester should be singled out. There's a na national coalition, which is fantastic, okay? And convalescent plasma has been found to be safe. So we recently completed a paper uh, which captures competition between nonprofit organizations and, pro and profit ones for convalescent plasma, because there's money here. And some are actually almost price gouging, awarding as much as $800 for a donation of convalescent plasma, which is amazing. And this is something which is happening now. Uh, some of the issues, are, they're right out of a detective novel or a mystery movie. We have, for example, one of our top doctors at Bay State Medical Center, Dr. Andrew Artenstein, who was involved almost in a COVID, covert operation to get sufficient PPEs for his hospital. Um, he engaged two different trucks to travel to the middle Atlantic states to try and get the PPEs. Uh, they were met by the FBI, who was worried that they were putting them on the black market. And then the Department of Homeland Security got involved. You can read his fantastic uh, essay in the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, it's a really, really interesting, you know, all these different markets. But this is very unique. You have competition between nonprofits and profits. So. And also, um, there are additional different products that can be used from, uh, and produced from convalescent plasma, which um, I've highlighted here, and this becomes our model. So what we find is, and we modeled it based on what's happening in New York City, especially in the Brooklyn area, where there are a lot of survivors, uh, very important to have the experience of donating plasma as positive as feasible. Uh, also, Care should be taken when a for-profit moves. And you will see in some of the nonprofit blood service organization websites saying, please don't don donate to a for-profit, please give it to us. Okay, proximity matters, convenience matters, because there's always gonna be risk associated with traveling to uh, one of these collection sites. So, but there's hope. So now I would like to focus on analytics and policy. Okay, we've been writing a lot of op-eds and so on. And uh, historically, I think that's really important. And our work has been covered by the media. Okay, uh, it was featured actually in World Science Festival, New York Times Energy for Tomorrow, M America Revealed, and so on. And on March 11th, the pandemic was declared. On March 12th, I published an article on blood supply chains and the challenges in the conversation. And shortly thereafter, there was also an informs uh, Piece. I was invited by Harrison Tram to provide an update because so much happened only in a few days okay, as part of its analytics coronavirus chronicles. Uh, this article is still the most highly cited article by any UMass Amherst uh, professor written in the past year and it's only been up for like two and a half months. So you see the interest in this subject matter. Okay, and when it comes to coverage in the media, I think our community uh, informs has been fantastic in speaking on radio shows, TV shows, and so forth. Uh, uh, the print media, I've had the honor to be on a uh, Boston News Channel, written up in The Verge, okay, USA Today. And also, and I think this is very heartfelt uh, to be interviewed even on Farm Talk in uh, 
Fargo, North Dakota, and also a radio station in Los Angeles. And it's very important for us to be speaking out, to be doing not only research, to write op-eds, letters to the editor, and be available. It's not easy, but if you can, please do that. So on April 22nd, 2020, okay, a letter from the California Attorney General, Xavier Becerra, to Admiral Brett Sherrard, Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, was written and signed by 21 attorney generals of other states, okay? Requesting updates because of the pandemic blood shortages to blood donation policies. The article that I wrote in the conversation that appeared only you know, a few weeks before, uh, it was reprinted in White Science and it was the first reference in that memo and was cited on the first page. That I think is major is heartwarming and it shows how our work is being recognized and also impacting policy. And these are the signatures of just a few. You might have your favorite state there. I have Massachusetts, so great to see more a Healy signature, okay? So I think also enhanced visibility uh, through writing, through uh, speaking with the media, with the public and so forth, uh, is good for our community. It's also excellent for students. So Eisenberg School had a nice feature on me, public policy, and also UMass did as well. So coming back to this, okay, uh, many thanks in forms for also recognizing the STEM GEMS book, even in the announcement for this webinar. A few years ago, I was approached by Stephanie Espy, who's a visionary, who wants to enhance uh, actually STEM and role models for a generation of girls and younger females. So I was one of 44 females actually uh, cited in the area of, uh, net, of mathematics and for my work in networks. And it's a real, real honor. And I thank her and I think this is important. So here, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. I'd like to thank you very much for taking part. I'd also like to thank the Informs Practice section uh, for the invitation and our wonderful community of practitioners, researchers, students, faculty from around the globe. Uh, your work is being recognized. Let's stick together. We'll get through this and um, very, very grateful for everything. Thank you very, very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Nagurney. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot. My name is Carrie Beam, and my day job is at the University of Arkansas, but my job right now is manning the question and answer lines. Do you have time to take a few questions from the audience? Yes, I do. Fabulous. Our first one comes from Don Mustard, and Don writes, perhaps you could discuss your thoughts on the concept that COVID didn't create problems in the supply chain, but rather just expose them. What is your confidence that we will learn from this versus revert back to historical problem behavior? Boy, that's a terrific question. Thank you so much. Uh, I think everyone has learned a tremendous amount from the disruptions, and I think the supply chains will have to be uh, redesigned, re-envisioned to make them more resilient, more effective, and probably even more sustainable. And I think it's up to our community to continue doing its outstanding work. You know, it's better for society, it's better for the economy, it's better for all of us. Fantastic. Thank you. Our second question comes from Duncan Klett of Canaxis, the supply chain software people. Mm -hmm. Duncan writes, it seems logical that national stockpiles should be filled to close to necessary levels. Then supplies will throw through the stockpile so the oldest get sent out to hospitals for immediate use, keeping the stockpile current. What is your reaction to that? Oh, that's such an excellent point. And that's something I would think that we have to do in terms of long-term and actually even short-term policy. We have to make sure that our stockpile for our medical supplies for PPEs and so on are at the level that they will be needed now and in the future. And also he brings up a very excellent point in this, the issue of perishability and quality. Okay, we have to make sure they're up to par, otherwise they're completely useless and it's a total waste of money. And they don't protect anyone. Perfect. Thank you. And our last question, because I do have one eye on the clock and my other eye on our fabulous questions. This one's from Amira Masumi. 
writes, once the volume of blood donations and transfusions across the U.S. is back to normal, in what direction do you see the blood banking industry moving with respect to balancing supply and demand for blood products? I think there has to be more cooperation. Like in our paper, Dr. Masumi, okay, more coordination, more cooperation, and much less competition. No one gains from that at all right now. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Professor Nagurni, and I want to echo our thanks to the practice section of INFORMS for sponsoring these webinars. I'll turn it over to Patricia Neri, who's on mute. <laughs> Hello. Many thanks, Anna and Carrie, for um, these wonderful questions. Anna, thank you for your presentation. Any questions that Anna didn't have time to answer, they will be answered in her blog. You can see in this screen the link to the webinar and the blog. The webinar will be on demand. You can also see that uh, we have Carrie's and my email, and we want to hear from you. Please send your suggestions to our emails and on topics and presentations for future webinars in this series on the value of applying analytics to real world problems. And Carrie has an invitation for you. We have the, in the next slide, Carrie. Yes, we want to invite you to our next webinar. It is called Inventory Packages, Price Points, and People, an inside look at leading technical people. It's almost as hard as herding kittens. Um, how do the best geeks in the industry motivate and manage their technical terms? You can hear from Pooja Dewan, VP Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Otis Elevator. That's moving the people up and down. Anne Robinson, Chief Strategy Officer at Canaxis. That's moving the inventory. Mallory Freeman, of UPS, that's moving packages, and Palav Chatria of Citibank, um, he's moving price points. So come join us in one month, same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs>